Wealth doesn't just happen. You have to go after it and build it. And the chase can be packed with thrills, frustration, and adventure. Join hosts Chris Sevigny and Jamie Bateman on a journey into mortgage notes, a little-known but fascinating type of real estate investing that's full of human drama and perfect for growing your IRA or savings. We build wealth by working with distressed borrowers who are fighting to keep their homes. And that's why we call it Good Deeds Note Investing. We're doing good and making money. Join us. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am your co-host, Jamie Bateman, flying solo as a host today. Chris had some last-minute obligations. That whole full-time job tends to get in the way sometimes. But fortunately for us, I'm joined today by Tracy Z and Fred Rui. And I know you guys have multiple businesses, noteinvestor.com and Cashflow Expo, etc. And we'll get into all that. So I just want to thank you both for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And we appreciated your presentation at Cashflow Expo. We really uh, like the Good Deeds Note Investing podcast and your Facebook group. So Mm -hmm. thanks for having us be part of this. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I know Chris and I have been talking on and off for a year, year and a half about trying to get you guys on. And we finally made it happen. So I'm excited. And we thought today, like we talked about before we hit record, that we'd focus a little more on small business and working together as a couple versus note investing. I know we'll obviously hit on notes a good bit as well, but the framework for the conversation today. But before we jump into that, if you two could touch on your background a little bit for those listeners who are unfamiliar with you, that would be great. Absolutely. You want to kick it out? Go ahead. All right. (laughs) Well, I started in notes in 1988. I went to work for a large institutional investor. I had a background in real estate closings and they bought real estate notes, seller finance notes. And my mind was open to this whole other arena. And so I worked for them for 10 years, moved into underwriting and vice president role. And after doing that for them, great education for 10 years in the note investing space, that was in 88 to 97, I met this guy next to me. (laughs) (laughs) And so the note business introduced us and I'll let him tell his background because he came up from a different perspective. And then in 1997, we got married. (laughs) We started our own company. We left that institutional investor because we wanted to build our own business. And so since 1997 till now, we have been buying and selling mostly seller finance notes. We kind of like the performing first lien space, but we have some experience in non-performing as well. And we, along the way, have taught other people. We've developed some online expos, and but I'll leave the rest of that for Fred to provide <laughs> input on. I was actually just in the late... She's actually about four years, five years ahead of me in this industry. Not in chronological so, age. Yeah, yeah. Just not age, industry. not age. <laughs> so just I knowledge. actually was early... <laughs> yeah, it was early 90s. I was actually taking some courses at a nearby college on real estate. I was just actually just going to some night school, I guess it is, although it was community college. And I uh, was actually just trying to take some night classes on real estate because I was trying to figure out how to buy property. During that time, there was one week, the instructor who passed away, but was a good friend, was a gentleman by the name of John Richards. He was kind of one of the original ones that really kind of made it very public to a lot of people. One week, he taught me the calculator and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. i am like, I hate math, but I love money. And <laughs> it all clicked for me. So then he taught me the note industry in about a week. And then one thing led to another and I kind of followed him around a little bit and he taught me a lot about it. And then I ended up in Washington where I met Tracy, but I started my business at a 500 square foot apartment buying notes and just declared myself in business. I went out and got a computer, which at the time cost me like $5,000 or something stupid. <laughs> and I had a fax machine that had the thermal paper on it so that like the roll would like fall off the back. And then I learned you couldn't have the thermal paper fax next to the stove because it was a small <laughs> apartment and that just turned the whole row black. And so we left in 97, as Tracy said, she was a full VP. I was assistant VP of the company and we loved it. It was a six figure corporate job for both of us, holding handcuffs and bonuses and everything else. But we couldn't really buy notes for ourselves because it was a conflict of interest of working for a company that did. So we actually walked from all of it and then built that business on the note buying. 2008 hit and we all kind of reinvented ourselves a little bit as far as that was going. And then we started trying to move into buy notes and also give back. So we actually started creating trainings and stuff like that for people to learn our way. And we built our business since then 
with the goal in mind of being able to travel. So we don't regret leaving the corporate environment. We've gone to other countries for six months at a time. And as long as we have internet access, we still have a business. So yeah. um, that was really, really important. There's so much I can personally relate to that you're talking about. You've definitely been in the note space much longer. I actually got out of college, did some coaching, wasn't sure what I was doing, and to be honest, and then worked for a title company for a couple of years and did closings, did refis, learned right away how little I knew about real estate and notes, mortgages, title insurance, anything like that. So much that you don't know, you're not taught in school. And then I also have worked with my wife with different businesses over the years and then recently quit my job, but I think mine was a little more gradual. But yeah, there's so many rabbit holes we could go down. What was the mindset like when you did leave your golden handcuffs, like you referred to them? Well, I had started as a brokering notes before I joined the investor side. So I had a pretty good knowledge of that. But our job at the institution was to work with brokers and to offer them incentives to get more business. So we would have anywhere from 12 million, to, uh, I mean, up, I really, to, 20. up yeah, to 20 million on a big month. So we were dealing with the best of the best out there. So we knew how they all operated their businesses. I had done it for my kitchen table, not for their scale. I had worked with one of the biggest ones in the industry at one point. So we felt pretty comfortable going in and doing that. We tried to do it in stages. So Tracy Mm -hmm. left first, (laughs) and then I was going to be a little bit farther behind. But then at some point, it just got to be a little bit awkward for everybody. Not us, but it got awkward for other people. So then I finally left. But we knew pretty much what to do. It. I mean, most people, what we tell people now is, look, don't, don't quit, quit your job, your job. <laughs> yeah, until you're able to do it. And I think the big thing in the beginning into what, you know, a little bit of the small business thing is that people have a tendency to spend money on things that I just say, hey, look, buy that later out of profits. You don't sure. have to do that right now. And people get obsessed on the oddest things. What I love about this industry, particularly from a, hey, you want to go into it, we're not forging new ground here. This has been done for decades and decades. So, I mean, people that go, oh, you know, I got to figure out how to do this. Look, someone's already done it. The marketing's (laughs) already been done. Could you come up with a better letter or postcard? Yeah. Could you come up with a better networking or website? Sure. But the whole process of what we're doing is nothing new. So that's a good thing. Yeah, I come at a little different. I am very security minded, and that probably comes (laughs) from a background of not having a lot. Fred's nodding. Yeah, yeah. He knows. <laughs> so it was harder for me. It was much harder for me because I do come from a background. I didn't have a lot and I worked mm-hmm. really hard to build something and have the security, not the money for the money's sake or the prestige, but mm-hmm. the security. And so moving to not knowing where confidently where your next paycheck was coming from mm-hmm. was a big stretch for me. And I'm glad I made it because the freedom that comes along with it, with time and intention and ability to spend time with my daughter when she get home from school and all those mm-hmm. things are, were fantastic. But it, that was a mind shift for me and moving from a scarcity mentality to an abundance mentality. So we that's another thing we can unpack. But that yeah. all was a little bit harder for me probably than for Fred. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I totally agree with people. Generally speaking, of course, everyone's situation is different, right? I don't recommend people just quit their day job without a plan. I mean, you had hands-on experience, Mm -hmm. like you said, really successful and people you knew what you were doing. So you had confidence. We saved up some money, right? We saved up some money. And you saved up some money, right? (laughs) Right. Absolutely. (laughs) People are motivated by stress in different ways. And some people, when there's that stress to go out and succeed, they will. I think most people are not. And it's not an assessment of someone's personal beliefs or values or anything like that. It's just that You can't sometimes always make the right decisions when you've got the pressure of, I got to pay my mortgage or I got a kid. You got to create that buffer, whatever it is for you. We were, I guess, relatively younger. So we had a chance to do it. Plus, we probably could have, if it didn't work, there were numerous other note buying companies that we could have walked in the door and they would have been happy with us. So it wasn't like we didn't have a backup plan and we had saved up money, but we left during the prime buying of all of it. I had the relationship, so it worked out well. But it worked out because fast forward to 2022 and you know we still have longevity in the business. So yeah. It's yeah. a great business. Note investing is an exciting space. But when you think of servicing your loans, you may automatically feel a sense of overwhelm and frustration. BiFi Loan Servicing is here to change that. BiFi is a servicing company founded by investors for investors and managed by servicing veteran Shante Duffy. To learn more, visit bifiLS.com. Again, that's B-I-F-I-L-S.com.
Yeah. So if you would speak to what your business looks like today, I know you have multiple branches of it. What does your week look like? What do you spend your time on business-wise? So we do still buy and sell real estate notes. We do not longer use credit lines. We were big on credit lines and building portfolios for a while. Now we put most of the ones we buy into a self-directed retirement account and we'll still refer some to other investors. So a portion of our time is looking at notes, marketing for notes. We also do online expos. I'll let Fred talk a little bit about those, Cashflow Expo and Wise Women Investors Expo, just an opportunity to share more knowledge with people about cash flow and investing and alternative investing. And then we also do coaching for members like I know you do as well. So we set aside mm-hmm. a certain amount of time to do one-on-one calls and also group coaching calls. And we're a second set of eyes. We can't give financial or legal advice, but we can give you a second set of eyes on a deal with like, this might be a good investor, or here's what I'd look out for if I was going to hold that note myself and invest my own money. So that's what our day looks like for the most part. Also, our daughter has joined us, which is really cool. And she handles a lot of the social media, website design, that sort of thing that our company does for people in the note business as well. But that's more her day. Does she have a self-directed IRA? (laughs) (laughs) She does. She does have an IRA. She likes the stocks right now, but she's saving up to get enough to buy notes. So (laughs) I have a 14-year-old daughter, so that's why I was asking. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Well, a funny story. Well, we'll decide to that later. Well, I was about family in the business, but we'll circle up on that later. You go ahead about the expos in your day. Yeah, I mean, there was a shift in our business that was interesting. And I think, you know, everybody talks about this whole giving back thing. And I got to tell you, 90% of the people that I hear talk about that, I'm just like, yeah, whatever. It's it's, it's your (laughs) shtick. I mean, it's just like, I got it. But it really was, look, I was working in a restaurant like 60 hours a week. So what I learned on the note industry and what that gave me going forward and the flexibility, I love the industry because to me, I don't know another financial aspect where everybody kind of wins. The note seller doesn't have to sell their note. So they get to liquidate a note and get cash. The broker, if there's a broker or referral source in there, they get a fee for it. And the investor gets to take money that's sitting in the bank earning nothing and get a better return on it. So I don't know another industry that's that good. We did not for years have any kind of training or anything like that just because we weren't. We just didn't, we didn't do it. It Uh, takes time. It takes a lot of time. I will say that like our membership and stuff takes a lot of time. It's not a free for all. We only open up the doors twice a year. We Mm -hmm. limit it because we don't outsource it. It's us. We don't have a help desk. We don't hire people. But flashing forward, we're always coming up with too many ideas. So the idea hit me a couple of years ago on a couple of things. One was the best of notes, which you guys were actually nominated on the podcast, which was awesome. And they won Um, for best Facebook Facebook group, which which came from the idea of two and a half years ago, I was in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and they were doing the best of in the newspaper. And I just saw the headline, who has the best cheeseburger? And I'm like, well, I want to know who has the best cheaper. <laughs> and then I realized, I'm like, how has nobody done this in the note world? The best of the best. So we did it. And it's been great. A lot of people sharing that and showing it. And it's been, yeah, that's, that's been fun. That's been cool yeah. to track. And the other thing I wanted to do, which was the, I saw somebody about four and a half years ago now do a, what ended up being cash flow expo for me. But he did one on Airbnb in England, and he, and he had all these different speakers talking about how they do their Airbnbs, and there was no cost to attend. They could buy tickets that they wanted that gave them access, lifetime access to the recordings. And I thought that was a really neat model. And I thought, could we find other speakers in our industry that were willing to give their time and do this event and make it completely free for everybody? Now, we broadened it a little bit. It wasn't just notes. A lot of it's real estate, some mm-hmm. crypto and some factoring and things like that. So we got included some really great speakers. And the only rules we had on that were, I didn't want it to be a pitch fest. I didn't want people for $10,000 join us type thing. It had to be solid information. And obviously people could put forth information on how to get a hold of you later and things like that. And that really blew up. I mean, just from the first year, I had no idea if it would even work. So we just finished our fourth one and we had over 3,000 registered attendees. There's over 6,000 just in the database as far as that, but great attendance, great speakers, great lineup. It's three days long. How was it for you? you Yeah. I mean, well, I appreciate you guys inviting me to be a part of it. It was good. It was great. I got a chance to watch a lot of the other presentations as well. And I know last year it was really good as well. So I know the last two years I've watched a lot of the content and it's been really good. So, I mean, I think you were not that anybody saw the pandemic coming, but you timed it pretty well from that perspective. Yeah. <laughs> we were online before it was cool. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Or required. <laughs> or required. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's people wonder like how you pull that off because yes, there is a small fee if you want to keep the content, right? Or the access to it. But I mean, like you touched on adding value, that's all it is. <laughs> of course, there's some bit of marketing and exposure that happens for the content creators, if you will. But I think people expect that. So yeah, I think it's been a phenomenal success. I don't know what it looks like behind the scenes, but I think it's been really good. And I like the fact that like you touched on, it's not just notes. Notes are awesome. That's 90% of my own professional focus, if you will. But there's more to there are other cash flow and other asset classes and so I'm curious about that. Is the goal to expand that going forward? Actually, it, it's always been the goal to be more diverse. That was always the goal. It was just challenging in the beginning to find and vet speakers. And now we have a pool because the other event we do is Wise Women Investors, which is it's a mirror of Expo. It's the same idea. It's just less days. But that's only women speakers, which gave us an opportunity to focus on women speakers, which was Tracy's thing. And that really came about partially, and I'll let you talk about it, but we would go to these predominantly note conventions or other conventions, and it was just like all men, like women aren't in the industry or haven't been in the industry for a long time. And so- And I know that odd. to be different because I know mm-hmm. lots of women yeah. that are in the industry, just yeah. maybe not up on the stage. And so mm-hmm. I thought it would be a really nice opportunity for women to see other women in the industry and speaking about- different kinds of investing. Because when you see other people doing it, you go, hey, I can do that too. You gain a little bit of confidence. So yep. that's another avenue. So we'll have our third year of wise women investors this year. So we're a year behind. Yeah. And I want to touch on one thing about that though, to people listening necessarily, mm-hmm. is that all the data shows that the fastest growing group of investors and in managing their own money is women. That they also manage the household money more than the men do. And they also mm-hmm. dictate where that money goes. So to do these events and make it just an old boys network of thing like that, I think is a missed opportunity. So to your point back on Cashflow Expo is, yeah, we're constantly trying. I felt good about the mix this year. Mm-hmm. Is it heavier real estate? Absolutely. But right now, real estate is hot. So it's kind of hard to avoid that. But we, you know, like, so we got crypto and factoring and a bunch of other things in there as well. Yeah, that's cool. I know Chris and I have recently reviewed our top five episodes from last year, as far as the podcast goes. And I think four out of the five had women on it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just, I'm glad that the public, it seems to be the support for that. And I think that's really cool for both of your events there. So as far as working together as a family now, I know from personal experience that can be challenging. My wife and I did. (laughs) No, it's It's just us, I guess. It's just us. Nothing comes to mind. (laughs) (laughs) Except for something right before we hit record, probably. (laughs) My wife and I, we have a rental portfolio. We did rehabs together and grew that portfolio in Maryland. And then she also technically was my only employee for Labrador Lending for a while there until the pandemic hit. And she kind of had to transition to being a stay-at-home teacher, but it's not easy. And so I'm just curious, and you've got multiple, running a small business by yourself is not easy. I mean, just period is not easy. So I'm curious if you could speak to some of the challenges and how you've addressed those. doesn't have to be too personal, but how do you separate Uh, your your personal life from your business? How does that work? Give us a peek behind the curtain. I think showering is important. I think, <laughs> showering, uh, showering's good. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are two things, and it depends on the makeup of the personalities. So the two takeaways I have right out of the gate, I think would say is that particularly when you're dealing with two very dynamic personalities, first thing, what, what's most important we learned early on, which we, by the way, learned on putting up a closet organizer, we both can't take the lead on a project. We have to have very separate responsibilities. So any couple's problems that become challenging when we overlap. So we try to have, okay, this is your job. This is my job. Or if it's something we're both going to have to do simultaneously, we basically just say, okay, this is your baby. So I'm going to take a step back and I'm just going to do what you tell me to do on this project because you really get into tension on that unnecessarily. The couple Mm -hmm. thing can be really strong, but it can also be a problem. So like if you come up with something and you give it to the other person, but Hey, look, it's like a kid. It's like, look what I made. Any bit of criticism, which is legit criticism, (laughs) right? you take it wrong. You take it personal. Uh, you take it personal. Really. Yeah. So yeah. you really have to frame that going into it. So we both big, do that. The big thing is separate responsibilities whenever possible. And when you have that overlap, recognize where you're coming from. The other thing for me is that we have separate offices. I just don't mm-hmm. think you can work in the same office. But one thing I had to realize early on was 
we have different techniques of doing something. This is very much when we were on the phone a lot with note sellers. I would listen to her on the phone and I'm like, oh, I would never say that. Because I had a lot, <laughs> I had more experience of, of phone time with sellers. She had more experience on the investor side at that point. And I'm like, oh my God, why did you say that? <laughs> and she would have the same with me. And you have to realize that you have different styles and be confident in knowing that that person is going to get to the finish line. It's just not the way you would do it at all. And so I think for me, those were the two big things. What about for yeah. you? Yeah. That's good. Well, I was going to say, don't work in the same office. That yeah. We learned that. We thought we could. She's very loud. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We don't want to start a fight on the episode. <laughs> Could be the most viewed ever. That's <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. The rest of the session is now pay per view. So <laughs> right. uh, we'll it it's like reality TV, <laughs> right? right? That That's sells. Right. That whole dynamic in general comes with so many challenges. It's very nuanced. It's very specific to, like you said, the personalities and what type of business you're running and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm generally the one kind of pushing things forward. And the thing is with me, my wife, there's no actual deadline. Like she'll kind of ignore what I say and I get it. Right. But if it were someone else who was a, she's not related to, it's just, she's maybe a little more quick to get things done, but absolutely. We had the same kind of struggles where it's like, that's not how I would do it, but you know, that's yeah. probably a good thing. I mean, most, <laughs> there's not only one way to skin the cat. And that's one thing I love about notes yeah. and real estate. And there's not just one way to do things. So have to take off the personal aspect of you really have to put aside personal feelings and then realize you have to be in work mode. Yeah. It's the same thing at the end of the day. I mean, we have a stupid amount of output. Like I look at what we do and, and yeah. it's, it's just stupid. We're, I mean, yeah. so you have to like get to the end of the day and go, okay, look, we're done talking about work because yeah. we also like what we do, which yeah. means it can blend into other conversations and that's a problem. So you have to kind of shut that off. Same thing in the morning. If somebody's up before the other person, until I finish my cup of coffee, my first cup, we're not launching into any work stuff. I mean, it's just, that's kind of the rule. We'll do that to each other. If somebody starts in the conversation, we'll look down at our cup. Yeah, we'll, look at we'll cup show like, our um, cup like, uh, we're not empty yet. So, <laughs> uh, thought about that yeah, yet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this did not happen immediately. So yeah. oh, God, no. uh, it took time to develop. And like I, yesterday, after, yeah. after 30 years of being out there. Yeah. <laughs> I think you just have to have your permission. You just have to say when you're not in the heat of the moment, I need this. And what can I say that it doesn't escalate something like bottom of the cup of the coffee, or it's after five, or just something that you can say, my brain is full. That's a far side cartoon that we often <laughs> make joke of. It's like my brain is full. So I, for me also, I incorporated language, like from the one thing, which is a great book. I really yeah, like that is a great and, book. Yeah. And so I can say like, this is not my one thing right now, because I'm also a little bit of a pleaser. So I want to do everything for everybody. Yeah. I want to make their life easier. And so I have to honor what I can realistically get done. And just, we have to agree together. What are the most important things? And that if it's not on that list, it's okay to say no and set it aside in a kind and gentle way. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think also the expectation. So we used to do this when we had the corporate environment. I don't know if we inherently do it now that we're not part of that. We would go into each other's office in the corporate environment and go, look, I'm not looking for you to do anything. I just want to vent. Especially as a couple, you want to fix it. And right. to the other person, if they're not wanting you to fix it, that's really frustrating. So you try to set up that parameter yeah. of, look, hey, man, I don't want you to do anything. I'm just, it's just like, it's a data dump. It's just like, I'm just <laughs> venting about yeah. something, not looking for you to do something. You have these different hats. I'm like, okay, am I the couple hat? Am I the business partner hat? Right. You know, um, am I the underwriter? Yeah, the... yeah. No, yeah. that's really good. And my wife and I actually just the other day, it's the same kind. I want to fix everything. Generally, I want someone to help me fix it if there's a problem. My wife and I want different things when we're venting typically. So, but it, yeah, we just started instituting something where I said, look, I'm just going to listen for 10 minutes. The only thing I can interject is repeating back to you what you're saying which is way more challenging than it sounds like for me. Right, right. <laughs> but no, that's really good. And speaking of the multiple hats, just I think even without the couple dynamic, it's that can be challenging with the work from home thing going on much more now because of the pandemic. And then if you do have multiple businesses, like Chris and I have BiFi loan servicing now. And so there are times where it's like, is uh, Shantae, I'm wearing my lender hat now. <laughs> Shantae, right, right, I'm wearing right. my owner hat now. So I just think given the nature of the world we live in now, it's just that's even more important 
to define kind of what role you're currently playing because the boundaries aren't quite as clear as they were when it was, oh, one person works a nine to five and then they come home. Like you said, it's a work in progress. You're never there, right? But you guys have obviously done a good job of navigating those challenges. We still um, like each other, so <laughs> that's good, right? <laughs> I mean, I, think, it, I didn't hear Fred say. Yeah, no, he just I'm, laughed. Did you notice he just laughed? Kind of maniacally. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> you know, what were you going to say, Fred? I was going to say your point on the hats now, because of the speed of which everything happens, you have the different hats, and that's where, like, the book, the one thing, and stuff like that starts to help as far as okay, what am I going to focus my efforts on? What action is truly going to move the needle? So I get sucked up into busy work, but not productive work. We're going through a thing right now on the marketing company side where we're having to go, okay, there are certain clients or certain things that just, we can't do everything. So you just have to go, okay, what do I have to let go? Because it's just too much or too busy. Or or outsource. Or outsource. or Yeah. So you're constantly looking at that, but we keep pretty much in touch as far as what we're working on and what the highest priority and. I just sent her an idea that I thought was spectacular yesterday. And she's like, I don't have time for this. I don't want to go right now. <laughs> I didn't say it you know, like that. She said, no, you know, my plate's full enough. And I, I'm like, my, I didn't have let's revisit this in 2035, whatever. <laughs> well, and it, you, know, so. you know, and it's true. It's like, it could be a genius idea, but there's also the opportunity cost of what Tracy's not and, then going to work there on. Is. There's um, an analogy I heard a long time ago, particularly when you start, everybody talks about teamwork mm-hmm. and helping the other person. And the analogy I heard a long time ago, and I actually don't know who to credit it to, but they equate it to being teamwork. Most people think of, hey, I'm going to come over and help you. Mm -hmm. And the analogy they used was like baseball. And if I'm on first base, you're on second base. The very most important part of the teamwork is for me to cover my base before I Mm -hmm. ever help you. And a lot of us on teamwork, we think teamwork, I'm jumping up and helping you. But then I've left my entire side position in this case. On a base. Yeah. yeah. So, really so some of it, it's like, it's like learning to go. say no on certain yeah. things, yeah. but the whole teamwork thing is you got to hold down your side is probably more important <laughs> than jumping over and helping the other person. Cause you know what? They've already got something to worry about. They don't need to worry about your crap too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah that's really good. I like that. You mentioned your daughter. Do all three of you work with the marketing company? We do. Okay. So the marketing company came about in 2004. Yeah, somewhere in there. I'd have to go back and look. But basically, it came out of necessity. We were outsourcing a lot of note-related stuff, websites and email campaigns and things like that. And we just mm-hmm. decided, you know, it's expensive. Let's learn it. I've always loved marketing, that side mm-hmm. of it. So we just said, let's just take it over ourselves. So then that kind of turned into its own entity. Mm-hmm. I love email marketing and funnels. And we've got mm-hmm. really big clients. We do that for social media, things like that. So we were able to turn some of it into the note business, but a lot of it's outside the note business. Yeah. So our daughter, when she first saw us all working and she's like, I'm never going to be in that business. And so she went to school. She got two degrees. She was really into the outdoors. So she did a lot of whitewater rafting, guiding and all these different things. And then Mm -hmm. she started to realize that uh, those industries don't pay as well. Right. And so she would still like freedom. And so then she got interested in her business. So I'm super happy she worked for marketing companies in the outdoor industry and other things and super happy she had all that experience. And then now she works with this and now she's getting very interested in the investing side of the notes. So I'm like, and this is nothing we've ever pushed on her. It's all, it has to be something they want to do. So Mm -hmm. we're pretty excited, pretty giddy that she gets to work with us. And it's the same thing working with your kid. You've got to realize what hat you're wearing in that moment. And they have their own things of, are you talking as a parent or are you talking as a boss? And so that would be an interesting conversation to have from her perspective as well. (laughs) But we've always said to ourselves, we're your parents first, I'm your mom first. And so that comes first. And just like with Fred, I'm his spouse, I'm his life partner first, and then I'm his business partner. So if I have to choose between what's the best reaction in that moment, I just remind myself of that. That has served us well so far. I don't recommend it for everyone, but for us, it's worked out. Like I said before, we like each other, we love each other. And so it's fun to get to work with people. The good side of working with people that you're related to, you know, they got your back. You don't have to worry about (laughs) that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Curious, this is in the weeds a little bit, but what do you do for health insurance? It's something I don't hear people talk about enough, people who are we, self-employed. We have the high deductible plans and we use an HSA. So okay. we set that up for everybody. 
We've tried to look at trying to get a corporate plan. It's just, it hasn't just worked too, for us. Too so expensive. we do the high deductible plans with an HSA and, you know, HSAs can be self-directed and then you can put those into notes if you want or into the stock market. So there's some opportunities there as well, the health savings account and all the self-directed IRA companies offer them. We all like Quest and NewView and Kama and all the equity yeah. trusts. I feel like the self-directed thing is has grown some as far as exposure or, or the knowledge base, I guess, if you will, in the last five or 10 years, maybe just because I'm more aware of it now, but I feel like it's still very much unknown. So you all participate in that personally as far as self-directed accounts? Yeah, I think it's not only unknown. When you talk to Quest, you talk, I mean, okay, so there's the people that don't even know about it. Right. Then there's the people that know about it. Then there's the people that know about it and actually put money into the account and still have like, I can't remember what they said their money sitting there is uninvested, but it was a huge, huge number yeah, 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 of yeah. just we had, money yeah. sitting there that people don't take any action with. I think it, it was because we had, uh, was it Quest guy on and he, it was a yeah. massive amount of money. Yeah, it's it's something cash. stupid. I want to say like 400 million or something. I don't yeah. know. We got to yeah. look it up. We'll look it up and add it to the show notes. Right? It was a big number, whatever it was. It was a shocking yeah, number. Yeah. But it's a fantastic way to go for note investors in particular, because yeah. there's no real inherent tax benefits to notes. I mean, yeah. like every asset class yeah. has pros and cons, right? And sure. yeah. you've highlighted some of the pros of note investing. One is you can travel. I mean, you really can be a note investor from anywhere. There's That's something the gurus talk about that I think is accurate. That would be accurate, yeah. <laughs> um, but as far as taxes go, it's ordinary income, typically speaking, if you're yeah. buying and selling yeah. and collecting that interest. But why not just use a self-directed account and solve that problem? So that's something that's, I think the word needs to continue to get out there. I love that you guys just to strike me as people who are really trying to add value and you do what you say you're going to do and you're just genuine and authentic. And I think that goes a long way in today's world, especially. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, we appreciate that. I mean, we try to be just no nonsense, even like our training and stuff like that. Like, I'm not going to sell anybody in our training. Either it's right for you or it's not. I just think it's the way you do business. Um, I think yeah. if that was the only thing somebody said about me in my whole life when I went to my grave, I, that would make me feel good. So thank you. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so thank just, you. That's important to us. Yeah. Just play back this, you know, that yeah. snippet. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> No, I mean, I like to think of myself in the same way. So that was yeah. a genuine comment on my part. But anyway, you mentioned the one thing, kind of a, are there any other books that you kind of refer back to or that you really liked over the years? Yeah, I like Atomic Habits also by yeah. James Clear. He's That's great. One of, yeah. You like that one too? I like his weekly, it's a real short newsletter he puts out as well. I was going to say the who, not how. Yeah. He was on your last he year. He was right? last year. Yeah. And look, anytime you can do the subject of who to hire and not how to do it, and actually have that guy write your book for you. I mean, man, that's not a genius illustration <laughs> yeah. of it. I don't know what is. The idea of, is it better just to have somebody else do it? That's a challenge. And we didn't really touch on that, but that's a challenge mm -hmm. on being a small business mm -hmm. that we run into. And I think anybody driven runs into is the ability to outsource things because no one's ever going to do it as good as you. No one's ever going to make it as fast or as pretty or whatever. And you just have to realize, we went through a phase probably about, it started about six or seven years ago, particularly on the marketing company side. So I would say to my mind, and Tracy had to learn this quite a bit also was the, is it good enough? Because mm -hmm. you'll never have it a hundred percent. But yeah. so even when I write an email out to the group and I'm like, mm -hmm. ah, I don't know, it's like, is this going to stop the action from happening? Is this going to stop them from going and checking out Cashflow Expo? Is this going to stop them from wanting to learn more about notes? If it's not, then move on. So the who, not right. how really kind of opened up my eyes to get to next level stuff is you have to outsource more stuff. You have to. You can't do it all. We already do too much. I like all three of those books. Yeah, the who, not how. I think it was because of your cash flow expo is why I bought that book. You're right. It's like the absolute, like almost mic drop example of, <laughs> of how to do it. Couldn't be um, any better. Really? Yeah. Only if he had someone come do his presentation at Cash Flow. <laughs> yeah, I'll present. And then some other guy, guy shows up. I'm like, yeah, I'm here to present. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> no, that's the outsourcing topic that's is really is interesting too, because that's actually, we're going to be down at DME and then IMN, but you guys are in Florida as well, right? Yeah, I'll be there. Fred has some other I'll be at the second one. Okay. Oh yeah, you will be at IMN. Yeah, I'm flying that's back right. in time to go to that. One of the panels I'm on is about outsourcing and it's I don't think it's a clear cut answer as far as, as you grow, you should outsource or as you grow, you should bring things in house. It's tough. I mean, every small business owner, I think needs to figure that out for themselves. I and mean, it depends what task we're talking about, obviously. 
Chris is really good at outsourcing and systematizing and bringing someone in for a project and then that's it, not hiring in-house. Whereas I tend to favor more trying to train someone long-term and bring them on and build a team kind of thing. We just work very differently, but both can be successful ways of approaching it. So again, back to what I love about small business and real estate and notes is just, you got to figure out what works for you. There's principles and tenants that we're talking about that work kind of across the board, but your small business is probably going to look very different than mine and that's okay. (laughs) I was going to say the one foundation thing, I think when you start talking about outsourcing or not, that I think everybody shares is you look at time first, not money. So Mm -hmm. look at what's taking you the most time. Don't even talk about what is a cost outsource or what income's coming in. What's taking you the most time? Because that's probably the biggest thing that's identifiable. The other thing that I think versus in-house versus not that you're talking about is that we want in-house. It all sounds good, but we find that in our business, particularly with multiple businesses, we have so many different skill sets that we need someone to do. It's like, I don't know who that person is. That person is just not going to walk through my door that can you know, do this and this. And can I train well. them? Like yeah. when she says, hey, we need to outsource this or we need to hire somebody for this. It's like, I don't even know where to start to tell them what to do. Like I can't <laughs> even make that list. Like I'm busy right. doing it right now. And I know that's right. not right. Yeah. <laughs> we do struggle with that. That's on our list. We need to reread the book again this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and I think it's you're just being real. It's you're always working on okay, putting together SOPs or we're using Loom yeah. more now for how right. to do things. And that sounds good, but like you said, I actually have to get stuff done now. So it's easy to talk about, sure. harder to do it. So it's like the expo. I can outsource the expo as far as I can still get the speakers and have someone do all this building and someone else manage the sponsors and all that other stuff. But between the three of us, we do it. Because yeah. I don't even know where I would start to draw, you know, do all the SOPs of what it takes. It's a beast behind the scenes as far as it's oh, coordinating, year, but it's only once a year. But so speaking of the expo, can the listeners still access that content? They can. It's closed. So when we do the expo live, every session's up for 48 hours, but they can actually still go to Cashflow Expo. And there is a link to be able to buy it at a discount too. So if they want to get all the sessions and then they have lifetime access to it at that point. Okay. And then we also had a few giveaways just for your listeners on yeah. some note stuff too. Yeah, we did at noteinvestor.com forward slash good deeds. We had the 21 tips to note investors, five ways to use cash flow on notes. And then we have some free videos on note investing 101. Yeah, we got a one-on-one series. It's pretty good if someone just wants to know a little bit more about notes. And there's nothing for sale there. You just watch the videos and learn. And No, that's great. I definitely recommend people check that out. I'm on your site right now. I can tell you guys, it's just quality content and you know how to write, you know how to present things. It's professional. And obviously you have experience over decades with investing in 32 notes, so. years. Wow. <laughs> I don't think it's important to keep throwing out. Yeah. The I don't think, <laughs> no. I don't think it's, a, I, don't I, mean, add it together, I don't think it just reminds me how much older I'm getting. Though. It's like, <laughs> we still remember in our minds, it's like, you don't gauge getting older by yourself. You gauge it by your neighbor's kid. You're like, Hey, where's right. little Jimmy? He's like, he's at college. And I'm like, yeah. what? You know, yeah, so the, we used the kid, to be the, the kid across the street is driving now. And I'm just like, what just yeah. happened? Oh my exactly. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Since this is the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast, we'd like to highlight a good deed that you all have done, whether inadvertently or not, but how someone else has has benefited from your business and your note investing. So we'll put that there. And then also a note and bolt. So if one of you could take one and the other take the other, throwing you for a loop here, but a note and bolt is just a nugget of wisdom for the listener. So training wisdom or something, whether it's small business or something about note investing that maybe the listeners wouldn't get in another training seminar or a piece of advice looking back that you'd give to maybe a new note investor or a new entrepreneur. I kind of would go back to what I said a little bit earlier is that align yourself with people that are giving of the information. It's an abundance mentality. Like I said, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, buy things later out of profits. If you want to have a super fancy website, or you want to buy it out of profits later, don't put that pressure on yourself in the very beginning. I don't think you have to spend $100,000 to learn this business and stuff. There's a lot of good free information. I mean, even on, like you said, noteinvestor.com, I don't know how many articles, we got like 400 That's articles on there that yeah. you can just read for free. How so, did you get noteinvestor? Yeah, look at the podcast. Yeah. On Facebook. So yeah. How'd you get that URL? That's a pretty good one. <laughs> uh, it was, we've actually had it for 25 years or whatever. It's but no, been, yeah. I love just to piggyback. I love the whole, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You mentioned that a couple of times. That for me gave me a lot of confidence as well. Just initially going into real estate investing, because I don't have to be the next Elon Musk here. It's like, <laughs> it's been done before. 
yes, I could tweak it. Yes, maybe I can make this better, or improve this part of the process. But that gave me a lot of confidence to move forward, just yeah. seeing that other people have done it. I think the only yeah. thing I would add also is that, and we've always had this rule, no one's going to watch your money like you. Sometimes you want to take a shortcut and go, hey, somebody says, hey, if you just invest with me, I'm going to be buying notes or if you just do this. And we don't recommend that. If you're going to buy somebody else and your name needs to be on the paperwork, you're not investing with somebody else. Nobody watches your money like you. And I don't say that to scare anybody. I think that's just a good rule of thumb, regardless of what you're doing. But you really should just can't rush it. I mean, don't force a deal. If you're going through and you're on the fence, then don't buy that deal. And if somebody, you know, broker it and make a few bucks and something like that, but don't put your own money in that deal. It's interesting because I'm sitting here, what do you pick? Because you can tell stories where you help somebody, especially in seller financing, that was able to buy a home that was turned down by a bank and now they own that home. And we have several of those sort of situations that is really a good feeling. So I really think seller financing serves that segment of the market well. But I think what was in my mind, because maybe it just happened recently, was we had a person we were working with that found a deal and they bought a little partial and it was all new to them, this whole partial concept. And so many people say, oh, you can't buy full sell partial. You can't do those things anymore. It's the old way. And I'm like, you can still be done on certain deals. And they found it. They learned how to use the amortization schedules, how to use a financial calculator. And it was like, it all happened in this short amount of time because they bought the note, they bought the partial and it paid off all within a year. And they had this crazy great windfall. It was just fun to see that excitement and giddiness and helping somebody else do the same thing that still yeah. gets me excited about the note business 30 years later. So I've taken a lot more joy out of working with people to do the same thing than mm -hmm. I just can't say my younger self yeah. would have enjoyed that as much as my older self does. So I'm enjoying that aspect of my life. right I now. I think that's really good. Just with my mentorship program, which is not robust, it's not my main focus, but similar thing where it's actually one of the people I'm working with said recently, you don't charge enough. And the thing is, I do enjoy it. I really do. And it's I'm not saying I have all the answers either, or I've conquered the world or anything, but I love helping somebody who maybe I'm a little bit further down the path than. And seeing those light bulb moments, kind of like you said, Tracy, as far as like everything kind of comes together at one time and just that success for someone else, I think is really cool. So that's really good. We've not only given them what's interesting is that particularly when you talk about people for their first deals, it's like the light bulb moment. I used to talk about that when I used to teach financial calculator and then people are like, oh my gosh, I understand it. <laughs> but it's not only the gift of that one deal that you've helped them do. It's like you can see the level of empowerment that they now have going, I can do this again. And so even if somebody just did four deals a year and it was an extra 15,000 or whatever it was, they're yeah. brokering and we're like that, that can have an impact on something. We have a saying that we say, you know, even before we made a lot of money was the whole, never think $500 isn't a lot of money because it is to somebody. Don't ever think $500, whatever it is, is not a lot of money. Enough. That's our threshold of money we spend before we talk to the other person. Yeah, <laughs> still. Yeah, even now. Yeah. So I buy a lot of things for $4.99. <laughs> right. Or just like, Installment plan. plans. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, this has been really good, guys. I think this is going to be a unique one for sure in a good way. The couples angle and the family angle and the small business and note investing. And we've hit a lot of really cool topics. Is there anything else you want to add? Oh, doing what you're yeah, doing. Yeah. I listen to your podcast. Yeah. I enjoy it. And I like the way you guys approach giving as well. So yeah, I just, we need more of that in the industry. So thank you for yeah. having us on and thank yeah, you for thank sharing you. your own unique aspect of how you come to the business. Yeah. Appreciate that. Chris and I try to keep it real on the show and there's ups and downs like we've touched on. There's good, bad, and ugly. And we wouldn't be in notes still if it wasn't a great investment strategy and a great way to go about investing in real estate, but it's not all as rainbows and butterflies as some people like to present it. Cotton um, candy and kitten whiskers. <laughs> exactly. That's a good one. I have to take note of that one. That's our um, friend. Our friend says that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this has been great, guys. I really appreciate it. Fred and Tracy, thanks so much for coming on. I know you thanks guys are for having us. Busy. Absolutely. And I definitely recommend the listeners go check out Cashflow Expo, noteinvestor.com. Any other places? you want to mention? No, that's, that's good. A, that's plenty. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. And to the listeners out there, please go out and do some good deeds. Take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. If you like what you just heard, 
feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues, as well as drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. You can visit our website at www.gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com to sign up for email updates for future shows and access all of our great content, including show transcripts, case studies, video tutorials, and more. Don't forget to join us next time for another episode on building your wealth and making a difference.